video is sponsored by Total War Pharaoh. Buy it if you love me. Ah, youth. It's a time many of us look back at fondly. Jumping in moon shoes to break new heights and ankles, getting expired gumballs at a strip mall Mexican restaurant, questioning the fabrics of existence in the thin veil that separates that of reality and the surrealistic void of primordial despair while watching Courage the Cowardly Dog. Wow. <laughs> Good times. But ironically, it's these very youngsters who are currently enjoying the responsibility-free era of youth who are often the most eager to be rid of it, but until they can enter the adult world, they tend to seek some kind of identity to latch on to. Many choose to be jocks, too many choose to be horse girls, and some of us find themselves with an addiction to fiction ancient Egyptian religion, such as our good friend Alex here. What? I'm not into Egyptian mythology. <laughs> oops, that's not your line. Right, uh, <clears throat> gee willikers, do I love me some Egyptian de deities? That you do, Alex. But even an Egyptomaniac like you can have gaps in your pantheon knowledge. So today, we're going to cover some of the more zany aspects of Egyptian mythology while also teaching you, in the modern era, how to worship like an ancient Egyptian. Now Alex, before we get started, we're just going to need one blood sacrifice. What is that? Sea people, Alex. Here to invade the Egyptian lands. But I, I thought the water tribe was a peaceful folk. While I appreciate you helping me hit my quota for pop culture references, Alex, I'm talking about the sea peoples who brought about the Bronze Age collapse and the destruction of the old powers. It remains a mystery to historians as to what the nationality of these fabled warriors was. Oh, no way. What? Who are they? No time. They're heading this way. Luckily, I've got a few thousand slave volunteer fighters ready to defend them off. Okay, Alex, you'll need to command them. Hammer and anvil, you got this. Well, what are you talking about? <sighs> okay, d don't worry, Alex. We can make you into a brilliant Bronze Age general with Total War Pharaoh. The Total War franchise is taking us to Egypt in Total War Pharaoh, the bestest and bronzest Bronze Age strategy game to date. If you've ever touched a gaming PC or been on a history subreddit, chances are you've heard of the Total War games. They combine turn-based strategy, real-time battle maneuvers, and sick little stabby animations to deliver one of the most addicting experiences that resulted in this video being a week late. With eight playable factions across three cultures, Total War Pharaoh brings this formula to life in one of the coolest eras in recorded time. I've been playing it myself, and with elements like armor degradation, dynamic weather, and unit stance options, there are so many ways to approach the customizable sandbox campaign that you'll never get bored surviving the collapse of the Bronze Age. I love these games so much, and to prove it, this is my live reaction to getting the email from Creative Assembly about sponsoring this game. But don't just take my word for it, come see it for yourself! I'm streaming the game live on my second channel as this video gets posted. So use my special Blue Jay link in the description to get Total War Pharaoh today and to let the folks at Creative Assembly know I sent ya. But for now, back to religion. The roots of Egyptian mythology can be traced all the way back into prehistory, meaning before our moist sacks of folded tissue we call a brain figured out how to rub a stick on the wall. With all that time, you can really imagine the amount of layers the Egyptians were able to pack into their religion, so they didn't just have one boring god, but a plethora of them. Jesus Christ! <laughs> not in this video, buddy. And those were just the major gods. That's not even taken into account the minor ones. Or the more minor ones. Or the Among Us one. Now, perhaps the first question on your mind is how could some dude on the internet without a formal degree in the fields of mythology, theology, or even anthropology be qualified and able to accurately simplify a religion that existed for over 3,500 years and contains over 2,000 deities? Let's start off with something simple, like the creation of the entire universe. We're all familiar with the Abrahamic version of events, where in the beginning, there was pretty much just nothing until God decided to plaster up some LEDs. Ancient Egyptians, on the other hand, had a few different creation stories, each of which I consider to be a bit more flavorful. As one story goes, in the beginning, there was nothing but a chaotic, primordial, cosmic ocean until a pyramid called Ben-Ben emerged from the abyss with a lotus flower that blossomed into the sun god Ra. Which sounds like something out of a King Gizzard music video, and also undoubtedly terrified any space turtles that happened to be in the area. Hey Nigel, how was Leah's first day of abyssal school? Ah, she was a little nervous getting on the celestial bus, but she powered through like a champ. Little Rascal's still down there now, but I'm sure she's having a great time. <laughs> Now, while being the first and only thing in the universe is cool and all, it also really limited the amount of stuff there was to do. But hey, this is a god after all, so if anyone can find a way to keep themselves entertained, it's him. Well, time to go beat the bishop, and from his, uh... Wow, you're not gonna make this episode easy, are ya? 
Through making the bald man cry, the twins Shu and Tefnut were born. After this, Ra started to cry, which I'm sure many of you gents can relate to, and humanity was created from his sweat and tears, and thank god the fluid stopped there. Tefnut and Shu then had offspring themselves, and with who you might ask, well, right now we're up to three existing things, and one of them tends to be preoccupied in his room, so do the math. They gave birth to the god of the earth, Geb, which was one letter off from making my day, and the sky goddess Nut, whose name really for foreshadows the theme of Egyptian mythology. These two siblings then had kids, with who, again do the math, now we're really starting to rack up a big list of major deities with a shocking amount of shared genetics that would bring a tear to any British monarch's eye. But hey now, you're a teenager with an obsession, that means you've gotta be quirky and different, and knowing just the most well-known aspects of Egyptian mythology won't cut it when you try to flex on online forums. So let's do a little speed run on some of the major gods and how to worship them so we can get to the fun stuff. At the top we have the aforementioned Ra, but depending on the place in time, he could be named Ray, or Kepri, or a tomb, or a moon, or if you place a fusion card, a moon Ra, or a tomb Ra. Are they the same god? Yes. But are they different gods? Yes. What? Questions are for the weak, Alex. Just smile and build some triangles. Despite what you think, this dude dripped out with a feather is not Johnny Depp, but in fact, Shu, the god of light and warm air. He was responsible for holding up the entire sky, so Egyptians thought clouds were his bones, whereas today, we now know they're actually chemtrails. He was worshipped through stuff like prayers and hymns, but since the bar is just hot air and cool feathers, you can just go to Burning Man. Tefna is the goddess of moisture, which is just... A weird way to put it. She's interesting because her name could be Automatopoeia for the sound of spitting, with the translation itself potentially just being she who spits. <laughs> Disgusting. <laughs> Shit. PUNISH THE BLASPHEMER! The Egyptians weren't even subtle about it either. In some temples, her name could be found written on the walls as just a pair of spitting lips. As such, you already inadvertently worship her today, when you use any of these emojis, or when you rage quit a Call of Duty match. For as the ancient proverbs go, spitters are quitters. Geb, god of the earth, was a real chill dude and was often just depicted lounging around. <laughs> looks like he's got himself a little romance going on. <laughs> Who's that? His sister, Alex. Did you really have to ask? Anyway, it was said that earthquakes were caused by the tremendous power evoked by Geb's laughter. Hello Heliopolis, how we doing tonight? Wow, what a crowd, what a crowd. We even got some Greeks here. <laughs> Crazy you guys found the time between naming every city after your teenage king. <laughs> Let's see, uh, oh. What's up man, what's the problem? Hey Geb, what are you doing here? Heard you're a funny man, came for the jokes. Let's hear one. Uh. Are you sure? Uh, are you sure you want crops this year? Sit down. Okay, okay, uh... <clears throat> so, there are some who say there aren't any crocodiles in Egypt. But I think they're in denial. <laughs> denial! <laughs> I like the river! Oh, oh that was good. <laughs> that was good. <sighs> well, if you'll excuse me. I gotta go catch a show in Fukushima. Set was the god of chaos and had the body of a man and the head of some animal that no one's been able to figure out. It's called the set animal and theories range from dogs to aardvarks to even giraffes and pigs, which no? He was jealous of his brother Osiris who wore the big boy sandals as ruler of Egypt. So in his natural bad boy chaotic fashion, he put together a little ruse for his brother. Hey Osiris buddy, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. Listen man, listen man, we've been having this contest. <laughs> I'll tell him, I'll tell him. We've been having this contest to see if anyone can fit into this super cool coffin. And so far, no one's been able to win, dude. No one's been able to win. <laughs> but I'm saying, I'm saying, my boy Osiris here, he knows how to fit into things real good. <laughs> I know about you and my sister. But anyway, anyway, why don't you give it a shot, man? <laughs> I know you could do it. Set tricked Osiris at a party and trapped him in a coffin, threw it in the Nile, and returned days later in a rage to cut up his dead body into a bunch of little pieces and spread them throughout Egypt. And then he became the king. Hey guys, so Osiris is feeling a little under the weather, so I'm gonna be Pharaoh now. Oh, but I guess he'll be back soon then? Hey, listen, there's this super cool coffin. Isis was the goddess of magic and sister wife of Osiris. After Set cut up her boy toy, she figured it probably wasn't good PR to have her king husband's body parts scattered across the country like some morbid game of Geocatcher, so she set off to collect the pieces. After a traumatizing and quite literal scavenger hunt, she was able to find every piece. Except for one. Can you guess what it was, Alex? Hmm, assuming from the love theme, his heart? <laughs> no, this is Egyptian mythology. 
mythology, not Shakespeare. She was missing his cock. The divine member had been swallowed by a fish, probably turning it into a kaiju. So she whipped up a magic one so that she could conceive their future son, Horus. And I'd just like to point out that before we've had a single non-incestuous relationship, we're already throwing in fourth base with dead brother. Too weird for you? Well, in another version, Isis breathes life into his body so she can get knocked up in bird form. Confused how that works? Not to worry. They left us a picture for reference. And while you could, I wouldn't recommend worshipping her today, as joining something called the Cult of Isis would send a very different message these days. In the beginning, Osiris became the first pharaoh of Egypt to give humanity direction and guidance after noticing how uncivilized they were. Uh, honey, have you seen humanity lately? Nah, they're just having fun. No, not them. Them. Scarab, so good. <laughs> gang, gang. Gang, gang. Yes, my pharaoh. Yes, my pharaoh. Flow. After his little dismember adventure, he became the god of the dead and ruled over the underworld, which they called Duat. Egyptians believed Duat to be in the west, where the sun set, which means, contrary to popular belief, they most likely were the first civilization to discover the Americas. Otherwise, I have no idea how they knew where New Jersey was. One way Osiris was worshipped was through a yearly public play telling the story of his death where reenactors, quote, beat their breasts and gashed their shoulders until the mutilated remains of the god had been found and rejoined. Wow, screams of despair and beating yourself up? Isn't that why you're going to therapy, Alex? <laughs> Looks like you've got this one taken care of, buddy. Horus is a falcon god, symbol of divine kingship and an S-tier smash character. One of the most important Egyptian gods, he's famous for his contendings with Set to reclaim the throne taken from his father. A lot of wild and insane shenanigans took place over this 80-year period of conflict, but one contest definitely stands out. And to tell this story without getting my video removed, we're gonna have to enter the Euphemism Colosseum. Let's say both Set and Horus each had long ships containing men of the sea. Sea men, if you will. One night, Set wanted to assert dominance over Horus, so he attempted to seduce his nephew and docked his ship at Horus's port, sending his sea men into Horus's territory. Horus, however, had a closed border policy, so he caught these sea men in his hand and threw them into the Nile. After this, he went to his mom Isis, who helped him coax his own sea men out of his ship, so he could sneak the little guys into some lettuce that Set then ate. Both Set and Horus then went to the gods, who heard Set's claim of dominating Horus by invading him with his sea men. But when he tried to summon them, they answered from the Nile. Horus then claimed his dominance over Set by tricking him into eating his covert sea men. And when he summoned them, they answered from inside Set, proving that Horus had dominated his uncle. <gasps> Yes? Horus was worshipped in many ways, but to keep it simple, just make sure the next time you're eating a salad to give an extra squirt of ranch in honor of our Egyptian top G. Anubis, the god's goodest boy, was the jackal-headed god of mummification in the dead. Like any good pupper, Anubis guided souls to the afterlife in the Hall of Truth. The soul would then recite the negative confessions, where it swore had not committed certain sins, before weighing its heart on a scale against the feather of truth. Have you sinned against men? I have not. Have you oppressed kinsfolk? I have not. Have you spent over a hundred dollars on Destiny 2 DLC? I, well, only if you account for inflation. Wait, 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 Kobe, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> If they passed, they enjoyed eternal life in the field of reeds, but if not, their heart was thrown on the floor and eaten by the crocodile-headed goddess Amit, the devourer of the dead, erasing their soul from existence. In honor of Anubis, it was common for priests to wear jackal masks during funeral proceedings and mummifications. Okay, let's get this show on the road. Oh, like Anubis, <laughs> right. Uh, but d do you know what you're doing? Don't worry, I do this all the time. Okay, let's get this heart out. What are you? It's tradition! But while mummifications are a little hard to come by today, don't you worry, Alex, there are whole conventions dedicated to this kind of worship these days. Okay, this is getting long, let's see who else we got here. Uh, Nephthys was the sister wife of Set and goddess of healing and protection, but also death and decay, just to keep you on your toes. You could hire professional mourners to play the part of her and her sister Isis to hysterically cry and scream at your funeral, so it seems like someone loved you in your life, even if we both know that's not true. 
There's Thoth, the ibis-headed god of, you might want to get comfortable, the moon, wisdom, knowledge, writing, hieroglyphics, science, magic, art, and judgment, who is also credited with creating art, writing, the calendar, and controlling space and time. Being a god with his fingers and more affairs than Blackrock, he was very respected by the Egyptians, who honored the god by sacrificing and mummifying ibises by the millions. There's the moon god Khonshu, he appears in something called the Cannibal Hymn, which is metal as hell, but for more just go watch Moon Knight. Sekhmet, a solar deity, almost killed all of humanity until she got too drunk drinking red-colored beer that she mistook for some nice refreshing blood, as one does. Bastet is a cat goddess in the calm version of Sekhmet whose worship provided the means for the first recorded instance of psychological warfare, which I covered in this video here. So, those were some major gods. How you holding up, Alex? To take the fursuit and the ranch with the Burning Man tickets? P please, can you cry at my wedding? Funeral? Funeral! Shit! Yes! Wait, d do you eat my heart? Looks like you've got this down pretty alright, buddy. Let's move on to some of the lesser-known rascals. Wait! Wait! Ancient Egyptians followed what I like to call the 34th Code of the Ancients, or Rule 34 for short. If it exists, there's a god for it. Fabrics and clothing? Step aside, Zara. The 26th day of the month? Sure, fuck it. My ex-wife? They've got her covered. Because of this abundance, no matter the problem, the Egyptians had a god to turn to, including the ones of the bedroom variety. Lady. Why are you staring at me? Before our gods of today, pharmaceutical companies, bless us with the blue pill, men and also women experiencing fertility problems in the good old days often turned to religion for guidance. And apparently, for the ancient Egyptians, nothing really screamed healthy sex life like a grotesque crouching dwarf. Meet Bess, a demon god of sexuality, fertility, childbirth, humor, protection, and war. Quite the resume. Unlike almost all other Egyptian gods, Bess was shown face on and was depicted as a short and chubby little dwarf man with the face of a guard gargoyle, a lion's mane, and a tongue that's always sticking out, either because he just did the one chip challenge, or because the gods are just so inbred at this point that it's a miracle he even has one in the first place. Being just the beacon of beauty that he was, people would spend the night in incubation chambers with naked images of Bess and his goddess counterpart, Besset, plastered on the walls to cure their fertility problems. Hey man, do you ever have problems getting a... You know. Say no more, my friend. I've got just the room for getting in the mood, so to speak. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, dude. The walls are just plastered with images. Among other stuff. Ew, but I guess that's what I'm looking to be able to do, so okay, sign me up. How's it going in there, buddy? I don't know, it's not really doing it for me. Are you sure this is the right room? Yeah, dude, it works like a charm on me. Here, let me show you. Wait, 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 no, 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 no. Bess stood for all things good, and it was believed that if a child was laughing for seemingly no reason, it was because Bess was nearby making funny faces. Kinda sweet until you remember Bess runs around displaying his gargantuan genitals like a hobbit crackhead from Venice Beach. So, Alex, if you want to keep the spirit of Bess alive today, you can always smile at kids from the bushes of your local playground. No, oh, what is that? Oh, that's Otten, a silver deity portrayed as a sun disc. Why does it have hands? Why do you have hands? That was kind of rude, Alex. Now look what you've done. Say you're sorry. I I'm sorry, Otten. Now say he's a very cool sun god. You're a very cool sun god. Now declare him the one true god and renounce your worship of all other false idols. You're the one true- wait, what? Aten's biggest claim to fame came during the reign of Akhenaten, who thought the sun disc was such a dope god that he figured, why bother worshipping all these other wannabes? So he put forth a decree that banned the worship of any god besides our little disc friend, and even went as far as building an entire new capital completely dedicated to the worship of Aten. What in Sun Disc's name is this? Wait, Akhenaten, I can explain. I I'm sorry, what part of one god did you not understand, Bayek? It's just, I've been, I, I've been having problems lately. <sighs> you should have come to me, Bayek. We don't need this pagan garbage. The worship of Aten is the light that shines upon all paths towards restoration. How's it going in there, buddy? I don't know, it's not really doing it for me. It's all about the hands, dude. Here, let me show you. Not again! Scholars argue that this Ottonism was the first recorded instance of monotheism in history, with Sigmund Freud himself even claiming Ottonism influenced the founding of Judaism. I can make an entire video on this guy, but in short, it turns out telling a deeply traditional group of people to drastically alter their identity carved from thousands of years of customs is a challenge that not even a god king can easily pull off. And it offended the Egyptian people so much that after Akhenaten 
Cotton's death, they attempted to erase any trace of his name and family from history. At first, you probably don't bat an eye at this, what with the CCP and Soviet Union having practiced people erasing all the time. But keep in mind, the Egyptians believed the soul was made up of several parts, one of which was called Ren, or a person's name. They believed that so long as a person's name was written down or remembered, it would help preserve their existence in the afterlife. So, by striking any mention of Akhenaten from history, not only were they trying to forget such a crazy attempt to reform culture, but they were trying to destroy a literal piece of his soul. Speaking of the soulless, pharaohs were not just a part of the Egyptian elite, but were themselves considered gods in Egyptian mythology. Because of this, they tried to live up to the theme of their divine connection. Theme? You don't mean. That's right, Alex. Egyptian pharaohs were often inbred to emulate the gods as well as to maintain their sacred bloodline. It's all set. Ready for your marriage ceremony, sire? <laughs> What's he thinking? There's no use guessing. His divine omnipotence is beyond our comprehension. <coughs> Does this? Yes. He approves of us. But what if you're not a pharaoh and just your typical average Joe? Well, Alex, along with all the aforementioned forms of worship, there are a plethora of intricate traditions and customs that one could follow. But since I'm on page 11 of the script, for the sake of time, just make sure you've got a bunch of amulets on you for every occasion. Hey, boys, do you have a few minutes to talk about serving your country in the Marines? <laughs> Egyptian mythology, hilariously wacky, but a little too Game of Thrones inspired, 9 out of 10 stars.